God, we praise you, we exalt your name. You are worthy of all praise and glory and honor. And how blessed we are to be your children who can come into your presence and sing your praises and glorify your name and to recognize that you are truly our sovereign God who provided our salvation through your precious son. Who remember that we would need strength and the in which we live. So you gave us your Holy Spirit. We are empowered to walk the walk you've called us to. We know that it is not always not lose sight of the fact that you have given us that strength through the Holy Spirit. And it's through him that we ask that we listen, and that the lesson is taught, that we might get a glimpse of our soon coming king and rejoice in that hope, which is our eternal hope, that we will be with you one day because of your work on Calvary and your overcoming of Satan through your resurrection power, which is ours. And it's in that name we pray. Amen. Well, we've come a long way since the first letters that John received, haven't we, on the Isle of Patmos and uh, <clears throat> the admonitions and the praises that were given to various churches based on their particular needs. We recognize that in God's omnipotence and wisdom and sovereignty, he was able to pick specific churches that have been churches that we can look back on and recognize that they actually existed. But in each of those churches, he was able to pick out situations that have been true through the ages with various churches. So it wasn't a message that was just given to a small group of people and say, okay, you people in Philadelphia, this is your message. The rest of you don't listen. I'll give you one later. It says, doesn't apply to you. And as you have shared the books in the Bible that you appreciate reading, what we have recognized is there's not one of those that don't apply to us, right? And Ellen, you're the one, you said Song of Solomon, right? How many of you think that applies to you? That's a hard one, but it is a beautiful picture of God's love for the bride, for his church. We have seen through the beginning of Revelation the specific messages for specific times, but what we recognize is they're eternal, aren't they? Because God is eternal. The world hasn't changed much. People live a little differently. We have a little more technology. We have some uh, <clears throat> opportunities that we didn't once have. We have more communication skills. We can get more places easier than we once could, but the problem in the world, the virus in the world, even though we see in COVID have all its little variations throughout the country, that's not the real problem, is it? It's the sin virus that started in the garden. So every scripture that we read, all those books that are your favorites or your go-to verses, all speak to that same problem. Man is in a terrible dilemma because of sin. But God in his love and his mercy and grace for us made a way so that we could deal with our sin when we repent of it and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> then we rest in his grace and we study his word to find out that he's sending us out to share that good news, isn't he? We've seen the beginning of the revelation of Jesus Christ given, specific messages given, and then... John get, is given more information to talk about the things that are going to happen and transpire in our world. The prophecy message that is in Revelation. The reason that it is a difficult book to study. John tells us that we are blessed if we dig in and study this because it isn't easy. Several of you have told me that throughout your <clears throat> church life, you have hesitated to do Revelation on your own. You have looked for studies to help you because it is difficult, but you're not alone. We were told it was. I love that. And we are told that we are blessed if we dig in and try to figure it out. But we can only do that with the Holy Spirit's presence and his revelation to us as we read because there's so many symbols there. And you will read numerous descriptions of the symbols from various theologians, people of various doctrinal backgrounds, all Christian, I mean, the basics are there, who will have little different views of when things are going to happen exactly, okay? I just heard that Pastor Bob's going to do Revelation next. I know he and I 
have talked about some of the ways we agree on things, but I know Pastor Trent doesn't agree on some of the timeline. Here's what I want you to understand, and I mentioned this at the very beginning, and I don't want you to forget it as we begin to wrap up this study. <clears throat> there are some things that we can't be absolutely certain of because God didn't tell us with absolute specifics that this is when it's going to happen. So if you have good Christian friends who are absolutely, without a doubt, free trib, believe the rapture will happen before there's any tribulation, the church won't go through any tribulation, they have scripture to back that up, and it's good, solid scripture. The people that believe it's mid-trib, that the time of Jacob's trouble and then Israel are separate three and a half years and three and a half years, the church will be raptured in the mid-tribulation. There are reasons why they can support that. We can't definitively say what's true because God didn't spell it out. Now, the amillennialists are the ones I think they have less ground to stand on. I don't think there's much way that they can prove it, but they will try what we call proof text. Well, it says this, it says here. What doesn't matter is which of those is true because what matters is that as those who have been redeemed, the bride of Christ, he's coming for who? Us. And don't you love this thought? When Jesus was here on earth, he didn't even know when. I bet he knows now. But we weren't told when. We were told to be ready to watch, to live expectantly, to be able to give a reason for the hope that is within you. And that hope is we're eternally saved. We will be with our Lord eternally when he chooses to take us home, whether it's before the rapture, whenever that happens, or if because, you know, we die before that happens. God is in charge. And that's the good news, isn't it? We could argue until he comes which one of those very beliefs and interpretations of the tribulation and the rapture is true. We wouldn't have an answer. In the meantime, he'd come and show us, and we'd all think, oh, this is it. Let me ask you a thought. I hope what's a thought-provoking question. In the scheme of things, with eternity in view, does it really matter when or how he calls you home? We're going home, right? That's an absolute. That's the reason we rejoice. That's the reason our faith can be strong in all tribulations. And many of you have been through horrendous tribulations. Not exactly like what we see in Revelation. But terrible things have been allowed to happen in our lives. We say Job is a good example of that, right? So what we always want to focus on when you study any book of prophecy is if you can't understand it, leave the mysteries to God because he's already claimed them. He has told us all that we need to know to recognize we're a sinner. I have a plan to fix that problem. Here is my plan. If you accept my son, then you're mine eternally. Once you accept my son, this is what I expect you to look like. We are called to be more and more like him. He tells us how to walk this walk. He tells us where we get the power to walk this walk. He tells us exactly what we should look like and exactly how we can fight the enemy. He didn't leave us without the instructions that we need to live a fruitful, God-glorifying, Christ-like life in whatever years he gives us. And then when he's ready to take us home, wow, won't that be heaven and glory and all those things? It will be heaven and glory. Exactly, won't it? Okay, so keep that in mind as we wrap up this, because this is the exciting part. This is the part we want to get to. We kind of got to go through um, the yucky part. Don't think you, I saw a card for, um, a get well card for somebody. He said, don't you wish life was um, a VCR? I guess that's old, isn't it? VCR. Um, VCR so you could fast forward past the yucky parts. And we all have those parts where we wish we, 
when we're going through them that we hadn't. Most of us, I think, if you're mature in the Lord, you look back at those and you see how he used those to grow you in Christ Jesus. And sometimes as we face what's ahead, we think, oh, let's just get through this and, and get to what we really are expecting and anticipating. But there's still things that have to be done. There's still a world that is lost and going to hell without Christ. We're still on mission until he says it's over. But we can't lose sight of that, even while we look forward to what we're going to see in chapter 19 of Revelation today. Last week, if you recall, we looked at the woes. A woe, woe, woe is the world and Babylon, and they were woeing themselves. Oh, woe is me. Life is so bad. They were feeling sorry for themselves. If you've ever tried to deal with somebody through a difficult situation, and you're really hurting for them, but the more time you give them and the more you try to sympathize with them, the more pitiful they get, right? And they start to have a little pity party. And every time you try to remind them that they need to walk like this, they need to trust it, oh, but it's just so bad. You don't know how bad it is. They begin to enjoy that, don't they? They like to be sorry for themselves. They kind of enjoy. I had a couple people in my life. I, it took me a little while because I thought, they really needed me to walk alongside him. And I thought, you just love to have a crisis or make up one so you get more attention. Right? It doesn't help. <laughs> okay? And that doesn't please God. And we see in Babylon, the woe was on all. I don't have my stuff anymore. You took away my jewels. You took away my wealth. You took away all the things that mattered to me. And they felt sorry for themselves because of that with no thought to what God was trying to teach them. You're in danger of eternal damnation if you don't turn from your wickedness. But I don't have my stuff. You know? And we see that world shaping up, don't we? We've seen it in past civilizations, and it's kind of, you know, tapered off at times, and we've seen revivals in many countries throughout the ancient world, and the more modern world, where God drew people back to himself, and we need a great revival right now. And I'm so pleased that we have a prayer time going and the war room going here, and our pastors are calling us back to the fact that we have work to do, and it's called evangelism. Okay, And we've seen great times of awakening, not only in our own country, but and we're going to see that, I believe, as the time gets shorter. But what we're seeing, that many people don't want to hear that. They still want that old lifestyle, and they're distraught because they can't have that. They don't recognize that it is leading them down the pathway to destruction. They don't recognize the lies of the great prostitute because they enjoy their wealth too much or they enjoy their power. Don't take that away from me because that's my identification. For the Christian, we gave that up. When we became Christians, because he demands that, doesn't he? You die to self, and you live to me. The old has passed away. All things have become new. So we can relinquish those things in the world that others hang tenaciously on because we found what fills the void. We have found the person that gives us a reason for living and is our eternal hope. The world is still hanging on to the false lies of Satan that if you have a bigger car, more toys, a bigger mansion, more money in the bank, if you have just a little more power, you'll be so fulfilled. And of course, that isn't true. That doesn't fulfill anything because there's never enough. And we've talked about this a number of times, but isn't that Satan's number one lie? Otherwise, people wouldn't be doing that. They'd be flocking to the church. I need an answer. I see you guys aren't doing that. That doesn't mean that God won't grant wealth to people who can use it and, and for his glory and give to missions as long as it doesn't become their God. But we saw that Babylon, not only the one in the Old Testament, but the modern Babylon, all of the world, as opposed to the bride of Christ who is in the world. We're living there side by side, and it's difficult sometimes, isn't it? The ugliness that we see, the fact that they look at us as, you know, that we really have three heads or something. You know, you're so bizarre in your beliefs. Okay, that's 
what we're going to always be until he comes. So we saw they were getting what they deserved by a just God who in his perfect timing meted out vengeance. And we've talked about that every week. It's an important truth for us as Christians that God is keeping a record. Okay? And when it's time, he'll unfold the books and bring the prop appropriate and righteous judgments, which we can't do. So now we're going to look to some better news in that heavenly warrior defeats the beast. Don't you want to say, go, Jesus, go. Get your team up. Come on, Lord, come on. Defeat him. But think about this materializing in your mind, this battle. And again, some of this is imagery. Some of it may, may be reality. They're not worth a debate. We just take the scripture as it is, and when it's absolutely certain, we stand on that. When it is not, we look at you know various views, but we allow us to recognize the truth is the writer called Faithful and True is breaking through the clouds in chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, come on, Ryder. Come on. <laughs> We're ra waiting for that. Whether or not Jesus is going to be mounted on a white horse, literally, or if this is just symbolically, the truth is he's coming, isn't he? And he's righteous and true. He's the embodiment of that. Now, I personally would like to see him come galloping in. How many of you want to see Jesus galloping the white knight to the rescue? But he, he already rescued us, didn't he? He is our white knight. <laughs> he is the faithful and true one. As we see what John has had revealed to him, he's reminding us of things that we already know because throughout the Old Testament, as well as the New, we are told that he is these things. Now we're going to see it in its fulfillment in a very vivid way that we have not. But I want you to get this picture in your mind. He's faithful and true. <clears throat> With justice, he judges and wages war. We've had a number of wars in that our country has been involved in. We'll just speak to our country momentarily. Some have probably been judged more righteous than others, right? And sometimes we felt like for the sake of people who are innocent and are being destroyed, that we have to wage a battle against the evil empire. Okay, There have been some just wars, but none of them can be totally just. Because even when we've been, quote, on the right side of history, if you read deeply into history, you will see there are some warmongers who made a lot of money on it. Didn't matter which side they were, and sometimes they were on both sides. Those are the ugly stories of war. But that's mankind, isn't it? That's in our sinful state. But yet God has allowed those to sometimes bring about good. Think about, you know, fighting against Hitler to end the Holocaust. That was a righteous battle. Did everybody who fought in it, did even all the generals, were they all Christians? Were they well, honorable men? Not necessarily, but God can use them to bring about his purposes. This is the final example of that. Okay. It says, his eyes are blazing fire. <laughs> he can see right through you, Right. How many of you, when your mother caught you in something or were disciplined, you thought, she can see right through me? Did your kids there say, how do you know? Do you have eyes in the back of your head? You know? And I've had students do that when I found you. Know, they said, how can you see all that stuff? <laughs> well, we know how God can, but think about that, the blazing, that fire in his eyes, and that idea that he can permeate everything. This is the power of our God. This isn't someone outside looking in that we can say, wow, that's amazing. He's the God who called us. I want you to personalize this description of Jesus, saying, that's my Savior. Make him intimate. He's all those things. But yet he called us in that one-on-one -on -one personal relationship, didn't he? In spite of being all those things. 
And he didn't come at us in that kind of power and said, you will bow before me. He graciously called us to himself through the power of the Holy Spirit, didn't he? Because he wanted it to be something that we wanted to be a part of. He said, he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. (laughs) That name, that name. We talk about this every week, don't we? Almost. That name that is above every name, the only name that makes Satan tremble, Jesus. The name that people continually take in vain. I told you about here Muslims. take Muslims would be aghast if anybody used Allah's name in vain. While they don't acknowledge Jesus, of course, we know. But when I was in a Muslim country, I heard people standing in line, and they said, well, you know, da, da, da. And I said, isn't that interesting? A God you don't even believe exists, that you believe maybe was a good prophet, but that you don't believe is God. Why does the world collectively not use God's name in vain? That they do. Use Jesus' name? Because he's exalted, because he's this writer. He's coming to set it right. He's coming to judge the world. Who hates that name? Satan. And he uses every moment, every opportunity, every situation to defame the name of Jesus, hoping that he can destroy him. We know he can't. He lost the battle long ago, but he's still striving to that till he's finally bound forever. But it's important to see how John is getting this revelation of Jesus in a whole new way. And I keep thinking, if I were John, if you were John, what would you be doing if you were getting this revelation? You know, would you, I mean, would you jump up and down. He fell down before, and though you all know me, I'd be bawling. Oh, oh, okay, wait a minute. Let me watch. You want me to write what down? <laughs> My quill is leaking. On, my eyes are leaking. Okay. How exciting. But I, I guess what I want you, the drama. This is our Jesus. This is our king by virtue of what he did for us. He sealed it forever. That's a hallelujah, isn't it? It is completed, but now we get to see the final act, if you will. The curtains are drawn back, and I just imagine that's sort of how John was saying, I'm going to draw back this curtain. Wait till you see what's going on in heaven. How many of you ever try to visualize what's going on in heaven right now? (laughs) Isn't that fun? Isn't it impossible? (laughs) Do you wonder where they're going, what they're doing? And all of us have loved ones there, and you wonder, do they know each other? Are they wondering when we're coming? Are they? We don't know what they're doing. We know they're not in, in sorrow, so there's some things I think that they don't know because they would not be happy. But there's activity in heaven too, but we're seeing the curtain drawn back in this marvelous scene. His name is written on that no one knows but he himself. And that means that only Jesus comprehends who he is so, until he calls us, and then we have a little bit of an inkling. When we see him face to face, as I alluded to, it will be different, won't it? There will be such an aha moment. Say, I believed in you. I always believed in you. I didn't, you know, in my life, I can hardly think of a moment I didn't believe him because I, I recognized him so early in my life and I knew he called me very, very young. And it's never been not real to me. But when he's real to us, <laughs> It's going to be more marvelous than we can comprehend, isn't it? That's why we can't always dwell on heaven because we've got to do the work he's called us to here. He said, um, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. (laughs) How did he seal us? How did he purchase us? In blood. He's still the king. He's faithful and true. He's coming on the white horse. He's going to mete out justice, but he can only do that because he was faithful to the Father's will to die on a cross, shed your blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is what? No remission of sin. 
Now think about this picture. This one, this robe is dipped in blood. Compare that to ours, which is white as snow. Pure linen. It should be flipped, shouldn't it? Based on who deserved what? I deserve to have my robe covered in blood because of my guilt and my sin. And Jesus said, I'll take that, and I'll give you a white robe, and I'll take the cost of your sin on me, and that's blood. That's the most vivid picture probably in all of the New Testament, if not the Old Testament, about who this faithful and true and just one is. A picture of our salvation in a totally different way than we can see it. We can't comprehend this early probably in our walk with Christ. And we can't start someone in here and try to explain, do you get this picture now? Do you want to accept this, Jesus? It'd be difficult, wouldn't it? We have to have that faith as a young child and see him in a different way. But he's nonetheless all of these things, and he always has been. And that's important for us to grasp as we try to live faithfully to our calling in these latter days, which are going to be difficult. I said, well, that's a huge part of it, dipped in blood. And his name is what? Word of God. In the beginning, the word was made flesh, and the word dwelt among us, and the word was God. We can't separate the three people, the triune God. It's a difficult concept. But Jesus came so we could comprehend who God was. He became the word made flesh. You see, in this picture, we're seeing all attributes of him, aren't we? If the word hadn't become flesh, how in the world would we understand God's love for us? How could he communicate that to us? He's too vast, isn't he? So he said, I'll do the thing that I know will help you understand. I'll let my son become one of you without the sin part. And he'll be an example of my love. He'll also be an example of my justice, my grace, and my mercy. But also he shows his wrath. All those things we can see about this Jesus who we think of as, you know, a little meek and mild Jesus sometimes we see growing up. And we think that's not who he is. We see this big, strong, not meek and mild Jesus coming on the scene to defeat Satan finally. But all these are parts of the God who called us and the Jesus that we have come to know and love when we put our faith and trust in him. And I love this bigger picture. It is the word of God. We can't separate it out. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in linen, white and clean. Now, that may be partly why I hope he comes this way, because who's going to be following him? Be us. <laughs> who's his army? Well, we all get to ride a white horse, be dressed in linen. I don't know how you ride a horse in linen, and some of you have never ridden a horse. It might be really troubling, but, you know, an army, an army of believers coming with our Lord. These are the resurrected saints. These are tribulation saints. These have gone on before. According to most commentaries, some of them say, have a little different view. But what we know is the saints, right? Because who are they following? Their Lord, their Jesus. How are they dressed? In white robes that he gave them, right? Here they come. We get so angry with what we see in the world, the evilness, the hatred, the ugliness of sin. We want to fight back sometimes. We want him defeated. Well, we get to be in that journey. In some sense, we're going to be a part of that. We're also going to rule with him. Now, some of these things, are really, really, this is just, talk about a fairy tale. Except it's God's word, it's God's word so it isn't. The world thinks it's the myth. We know it's truth because the Holy Spirit has revealed that to us. But we see that in the armies who were following him, and they were dressed in linen, white and clean. He cleaned up our mess, didn't he? If we had to clean it up before we came to him, think how dirty it would be before we figured it out and we couldn't clean it up. Okay. But notice this, and coming out of his mouth is a sharp, sword, which is to strike down the nations. 
Okay, we read in Hebrews, the word of God is a two-edged sword. And when you think, and it's, if you've ever seen, and have most of them have seen a two-edged sword, but think of that going in, you don't want to get gross, going in, coming in. It cuts both ways, doesn't it? When you're out of fellowship with God and you get driven into the word and you start to read the word and God convicts you, does it cut both ways? Mm. You know you're wrong? Comes back out. I need to repent. It can go back and you haven't got it yet. It's sharp enough to get our attention to do what it needs to do. And because he is the word of God, we see that both symbolically and in the reality. And then we see that he's taking the swords to judge the word. There's going to be a battle. When we were growing up, even if there's some age differences that might make it almost a generation, okay, we saw a lot of black hats and white hats Good guys and bad guys fighting each other in all the movies and TV shows, right? And the good guys always won, didn't they? And the black boy, guys, we knew because they had on black hats. Now, there weren't a bunch of Christians in Hollywood making that, saying, oh, the good guys are fighting. No. How do they know black and white? Hmm. That's the reality. They don't want to admit it, but it's a reality. Why do we always cheer the guys that were good? Why did people boo the bad guys? Now, they don't do that much anymore. I think that's all blended. But remember, yeah, it's twisted right, and it's gone the other way. But isn't that interesting, that concept? White being pure, but that's a deep spiritual concept that even the world recognizes while they don't understand why they recognize it. Because that God-shaped vacuum, that need for a Savior, our spiritual side made in his image, always has a longing for spiritual things, and we instinctively recognize some of that. That's why we even know there is good and bad. Otherwise, how would we ever determine good and bad? If we put the Bible aside, no Ten Commandments. In fact, you know, we could do that. And we could go to some places some of us have been where they never had a Bible in their whole cultural, in the whole history of their culture. You know what they knew? There's right and wrong. We Westerners didn't go teach them that. How in the world did they figure that out? God. Not in them because they're not believers, which is a false teaching that a lot of people, well, it's a little bit of God in all of us. Well, he doesn't look very pretty in some people, does he? No. What is it? Because we're made in his image. We have a spiritual being that tells us because of that. Just like we have a physical body. When you're we're raising your babies, when they first cried because they were hungry, did you tell them you cry when you get hungry? Their physical bodies knew they needed something, right? And they couldn't tell us, so they cried, and we knew what that meant. Okay, nobody had to tell us that. For all the instructions we have on raising babies and stuff, millions of mothers, oh, and I think I've seen them in Turkana land. They have this convenient thing with them. They just pop out and feed the baby whenever the baby's hungry. How do they know to do that? Nobody sit down and say, well, let me show you. No. We have that instinctive, right? And we don't question that. Everything that we're cognizant of. Our thoughts, the way our body works, all these things are God's gift and because we're made in his image. So our spiritual thoughts and our spiritual need is a void until we find the answers in Christ Jesus. So that's why the world worships in whatever way they worship, as strange as it may be. They know there's something, someone, spirit, whatever they choose to name it, that is greater than themselves. And they're longing to know that. That's why the world's ripe to hear the gospel. Some won't take our Jesus as the answer because they don't want him, but the world hasn't wanted him forever, have they? But because of that, we can see how God's going to judge it because you are without excuse because you have to see my creation and know I exist. And you have to feel in your own heart, why are you driven to worship something? We didn't get taught that. It's part of who we are because we're made in his image. So 
Jesus is coming to bring judgment on those who don't want to know him and this, the sword will strike them down. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has the names written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's never not been <laughs> King of Kings. He's never not been Lord of Lords. But he's going to take his position. Think about the legacy of the kings and queens who inherit the crown. They're always the future king. They'll eventually take that role. Jesus has always been the king. He hasn't taken that role specifically yet because it's, the timing isn't right. But that's who he is. Now, it's interesting that it's in this image, it's on his thigh. Again, is it really? Is it literally on his thigh? We'll see one of these days, you know. We don't know. Does it matter? Because what's the truth in that section? Who he is, right? Who he is. We tend to get hung up, and I mean collectively we, can get hung up on trying to figure those things out. Well, why in the world would it be? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> okay. They didn't. God didn't have to explain that to us. We don't understand. Is it really literal? We don't know. And nobody knows because it wasn't given to them specifically. Could Jesus and the Holy Spirit, when they were given John this revelation, could say, by the way, this is literal. I have a tattoo up and down my thigh. Or I have a you know, something seared in, uh, you know, with a hot iron on my, which we would hope that wouldn't be true. It, so we don't get hung up on some of those, and I think people, when they study Revelation, they want all those answers. We'll know in heaven, and we won't care, because <laughs> we'll be in heaven with Jesus, right? <laughs> but, but still, it's a magnificent picture. Okay, now I want us to go back to, um, go back to Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew for several passages. 1342. I want us to see this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is not a, a foreign title, but I also want us to see how the world looked at him in this role. Matthew 13, 42. Okay. And turn on the page. See. Oh, that's the one. Okay. Well, we'll read this, and this is not the one I wanted first, but this, it still it fits here. It says, The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawlessness and throw them into the fiery furnace. Okay, so this is what he's on his way to do. When we see him coming as King of Kings and, and Lord of Lords, but for the sake of time, let me, let me go to this because I really want to move forward to something else. These, these passages, I had them in wrong order because I had them in the order they're in the book. When you get into chapter 18 and 25 and then sections of Mark and John, when Jesus is before Pilate and with the inscription, he's the king of the Jews. Remember the Jews didn't want that? And Pilate said, I have written what I've written. Pilate had a little bit of sense, didn't he? Okay. They didn't want to accept him as the king of the Jews, but he was, wasn't he? And that he is king of kings is overarching that. But he was mockingly giving that title at his crucifixion. Okay. Now, I want you to go all the way back with me to the birth of Jesus. Okay. And see this picture we've got here riding on this white horse? Marvelous picture, an exciting picture. Okay. But how did he come? In a lowly manger, in the stable. Now, some angels did tell the shepherds about it, but it wasn't making world history. <laughs> it does now because we, we go over that story for Christmas. But he kind of came rather quietly, Lord, in a lowly manger to lowly peasant parents. He kind of had a quiet childhood until 12. There was no white horse that brought him. Right? And then the next time when we see him on a horse, it's really a colt, and he's coming into Jerusalem. 
Right? Was he coming in victory? No. He was coming to his death. So he starts his, this, this is still, who is he? King of kings, Lord of lords. That isn't gone. He lay aside the rights to those things. He lay aside the opportunity to, to act that out on the world stage temporarily. So I'll come as a baby. I'll come on a lowly cult, knowing I'm going to my crucifixion. I will give myself to you to kill me. You're not going to take my life. I'm giving it. Now he's coming in and said, remember that guy? I'm back with a vengeance. I'm back claiming what has always been mine. And it's blazoned all over him. What if, before he came down to be born in a manger, he'd said to his father, well, but God, you know who I am. I'm the king of kings. I'm the Lord of lords. What do you mean i got to do this? The triune God was in total agreement from the, before the foundation of the world. This is how it's going to happen. Jesus, you are going to give it up for the sake of the lost people that I created. What an amazing love for God to stand aside and allow that. He had to give permission for that to happen. Jesus even told one group of them, you know I could call down angels. He could have. We also know that he asked the Father to take this cup from him because it was going to be agonizing, literally, physically, spiritually, emotionally agonizing to go to that cross. He said, I don't much want to do this, to put it in our vernacular. But, nonetheless, and Jesus said because he was obedient, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and someday he's going to come in on a white charger and claim what his always been his. I love that eternality. It has always been his. Now he's going to claim it. What a beautiful assurance for believers that this has never been put aside even temporarily. I mean, it has been put aside only temporarily until he has fulfilled every last word that has been prophesied concerning his plan for mankind. Because God's will can't be thwarted. We can mess it up for us, can't we, and disobey him and that there's going to be some spankings, okay, if we disobey. But he has the final judgment. And so he's going to come, and that's going to be the eternality of it. And he will tread the winepress of fury in wrath of God Almighty. You know what the wine press is. You know how when they squeeze the grapes. I mean, they squeeze them as tight okay, to show the fierceness of that. That's the wrath that's going to be meted out eventually. That's what we sometimes wonder, Lord, are you ever going to do that? Yes, I'm going to do that. It's vengeance upon vengeance because why people rejected this one that came on the white horse. They killed him because they didn't want him. Now he's going to bring justice because God always meets out righteous judgment and he always does it in his perfect time, doesn't he? Not when it's convenient for us, which we like to think. But now, now would be a really, really good time. Okay? <clears throat> we have another angel. We had a lot of busy angels in heaven, didn't we, during this time? Okay. <clears throat> Another angel, standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather for the great supper of God. Oh, boy, a good supper. We're being called to the wedding feast, right? You're going to see that all these contrasts are showing the righteous and the ungodly. <clears throat> okay. An angel has been told... Go call all the birds and think of all the birds of praise. Think about the vultures. When you see vultures, don't you kind of get just a little repulse because you know what they're doing, right? Okay. Well, God's calling them to have a big supper. 
Come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free, slave, great, small. Now, as much as sometimes we want God's vengeance and we hope, we hope they get what's coming to them, this is a horrendous picture, isn't it? And it's something that we should find, you know, repulsive in the sense that we don't want people to be in that situation. That's the urgency of sharing the gospel. We also have to recognize God, in his righteous judgment, has every right to do with those people who reject him what he will because he has lovingly, in a long-lasting way, pleaded with them, given them opportunities. No one is going to face this judgment without having had an opportunity to accept Christ. Some people will argue, well, what about the people in darkest whatever? You can... We've been to darkest Africa. They almost all have heard the gospel or have people there who can share it. But he reveals it through his creation. And he said that. Sometimes those people had it in the past and they ignored it and the, the gospel died, which is what's likely to happen in our country. If we miss one generation, we could be in such total darkness if we live for another hundred years. People from another country said, we've got to go tell those heathens in America about Jesus because they're in darkness. But we won't be without excuse because we didn't keep the legacy that God gave us. And that's what's happening here. His patience has run out. You had your last chance. Okay. And if people don't take their last chance, you've probably all done that with your children. And you say, you, at least I would. Please, please take this last chance because I don't want to meet out this justice. But if they don't, you have to follow through, right? Because then they'll get by with everything. And it's hard. It's hard on the one who loves them. This isn't something that God relishes. He gave up his son so he wouldn't have to do this. But if people won't accept the way out, there's nothing else we can do. We're not going to be in heaven with them because it wouldn't be heaven, certainly. And he's got to deal with those who follow Satan. Okay. And <clears throat> so he said... Uh, Oh, how about this? Generals and kings. They were part of that Babylonian empire we've been talking about, that world, right? And their horses and the flesh of all people. Now look at this. How about this? Free, slave, great, small. Who escapes? Nobody. Because you had the opportunity. Free, great, slaves, small. God has given the message. Everybody's had the opportunity, and he's not judging us according to whether we're free <clears throat> with lots of wealth or whether we're a slave. But this goes back to what we continue to hear in this book, and God has told us <clears throat> before he went to heaven through his son. He said, I will have people from every what? Tribe, nation, tongue. You see, this is that, whole, this is that group. Oh, guess what? I will have people from all those in heaven. But those plain people... There's some of them who never accepted me. They too, they're going to be in that judgment. Just as he's calling from every tribe, those who deny him from in every tribe are going to be part of this judgment scene. As horrendous as it is. But that's pure justice, isn't it? All who came, no matter whether you were generals on horses or whether you were businessmen with wealth or whether you were a slave or just an average person. I'm calling. When the days of grace are over and the calling is gone, what's left are those of you who rejected me. But I have my people. I have the ones I've always had in my heart. And then I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and on his army. How brazen. Satan doesn't want to admit that he's defeated, does he? I'm going to wipe him out. I'm going. So he goes to get an army. Even after people have seen judgments, of, some people just ignore everything that's going on around them and pretend that it doesn't matter to them. Or they think, oh, down the road, when I've lived my life, when I've sowed my wild oats, as people used to say, then I'll come to Christ. Because somehow they sense they maybe need to be ready for eternity. 
But of course, they're not in charge of when that happens, are they? And then when the judgment comes, it's here. You, you can say that and go out and, and be in a car accident and be in eternity tomorrow, thinking tomorrow was the day I was going to go talk to that pastor and see what I needed to do. We don't know that. When the books are open, the judgment comes, grace is gone. And that's what they don't seem to understand. They don't want to admit it. And he said, and the beast... And the kings of the earth gathered to rage war, but the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Now, I love this. Talk about a comeuppance. Remember a few passages ago, we were talking about how they deluded, how they worked together. They had the unholy trinity, and they were performing signs and wonders because God allowed them to mimic what his prophets can do, and people were believing them. They were taking the mark of the beast. We'll follow you, and we'll keep our wealth, and we'll be in power. This is wonderful. Look what we're going to do. We're going to have this huge kingdom of the world, this utopia that everybody's always wanted. We're going to rule the way we've always wanted to rule. Their leaders don't have omnipotence, do they? They're not going to be able to fight Jesus, the king of kings. He's already won the battle. Now we're just seeing it played out. We see this army, this amasses, this great army with all these people following Satan. And then all of a sudden they're captured. <laughs> Let's think, uh, girls, we're all in this. And we're following our captain down here. And we're going to this great battle to protect our stuff. Okay? And all of a sudden... I think one of them was just captured. Now what are we going to do? Fall to our knees trembling? No, we're not going to see that happen. This is one of the most poignant passages, I think, in all of Scripture that helps us understand what Jeremiah says. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. And then he adds that caveat, who can know it? There's almost no day with our news, if we watch it, that our hearts are not broken and our minds are not amazed at the wickedness that people are perpetrating on other people. You find that so? How can people be that cruel? I mean, while we don't understand cruelty, you know, there's, there's degrees of cruelty, right? And I believe, and we'll see later, I believe there'll be degrees of hell, too. Hell's hell, but there'll be degrees of hell just like there'll be rewards and crowns. But th think about this. Because you're threatening my lifestyle. I don't care what I have to do to you to get it. We've heard that example of he climbed the corporate ladder and stepped along people along the way, and sometimes they get by with it, sometimes they don't. That's the world's view, isn't it? But we can only understand how heinous it is when we go back to what God told us about our own hearts. And I find this very troubling when I read that and remind myself, that's me. That's me. My heart, born in sin, is capable of the most heinous of sins. Okay. Because there's none righteous. All our righteousness is filthy rags. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Now, how wicked we act depends on a lot of other factors. But God didn't say with an addendum, well, not everybody's heart is that wicked. Man's heart, collectively, because we are born in sin, we are born with the potential of doing the most terrible things things to each other, acting on our own instincts and lust of committing terrible sins because it makes me feel good momentarily, it satisfies my need, whatever. The, that's the heart that we have. It's one of the reasons that the gospel is hard to present to some people who feel like they're pretty good. Pastor Trent's getting ready to talk about the seven deadly sins. And sin is ugly, and until we understand how ugly it is, until we understand that our hearts were before Christ made us pure in him, deceitfully wicked, 
we cannot totally repent because we have to see sin like God does to say, I am broken. My sin cost your son your life. Not just, okay, save me, fix me up, and then it'll be good. No, I have to be broken, broken, broken. And when we see how the world is, do you get angry at these people? How dare you? Why would you? But God says, but you're all capable of that apart from me. So when we get so angry with the world and what we see, and as I share with you, my mother's been explaining, telling me that. How can, I said, Mom, that's an unregenerate heart. That's what we were before he came in and redeemed us through the blood of Christ. So we see this great army, and they see their leaders being taken and thrown into the lake of fire, and they're going to be bewildered, aren't they? But not as bewildered as we think they should be. <laughs> we'll see that next week. But notice it's repeated what these <clears throat> prophets and um, beasts have done. They deluded those into taking the mark of the beast and worshiping its image. Remember, they kind of made it a bargain with Satan. You give me this and I'll give you that. And we even talked about, there are probably some people in the world, and I believe strongly there are people in the world, who are actually made a deal with Satan. He says, I'll give you all this if you just follow me. And that's okay. Well, they wanted the wealth. Said, okay, the bargain is there. And he said, these, this is what they got in return. The two of them were thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Or sulfur but, oh, wait a minute. They were thrown alive into it. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the right its mouth and all the birds gorged on their flesh. Now, this is a hideous picture to look at, and we don't need to dwell on it in detail, but what we need to see is this is the one who was coming with truth and righteousness on that horse, right? Bringing judgment. He was the word of God. He has a sword with him on his thigh as king of kings and lord of Who has the right to judge man? Because it's holy and just, isn't he? He's completely pure. And when he sees what has been going on for so long, and he takes away their leaders, their evil leaders, he throws them into hell, and they're thrown in there alive. People think, you know, maybe hell is just temporary. And I told you that a couple weeks ago. If hell's temporary, then we have to think heaven's temporary because it doesn't fit otherwise. Okay. Jesus warned, and we're going to look at this next week, more about hell than he did talking about getting to heaven. He's so desperate to keep people out of hell. I mean, when we have Christ, we know we're going to be with him forever, and that's good. We don't have to really you know, know exactly what heaven's going to look like. We're going to be with him. What else do we need to know? But people need to know that hell is torment. It isn't. Well, you're just separated from God for a little while. You know, some people said, well, the worst thing about hell is that we're going to be separated from God eternally. Well, that's true. But it's not just going to be, Oh, I wish I could be with God if I could just, but everything else is kind of good, and I'm here with all my friends. There's going to be punishment. There's going to be torment because you followed the one who led you astray, and you believed his lies. It is a place of torment, and I think it's essential that we believe that without that absolute truth emblazoned in our hearts and our minds, why would we go share the gospel? We could go share how people could live better and get along better, and people do that. The United Nations is supposed to do that. I haven't noticed that they did a very good job. Peacekeeping groups. Let's go make peace. Let's go make peace. There is no peace in the world apart from peace for the believer with Jesus Christ because that's the ultimate peace because there will always be strife among men, and God forgive us sometimes there's strife among Christians, and we need to get our act together because the world sees that. But you see how this is God's absolute perfect justice and judgment on the world? Who rejected his perfect and righteous son? What else could God do? But he does it because he's sovereign and able to do it without equivocation. And we wouldn't know quite how to do it. But this ugly scene shows us the consequences of unrepented sin. We're going to stop there and pick it up to um, talk about those thousand years, which also are, are confusing. But, okay, 
if I confused you. Questions, does it make sense? Thank you for joining Marianne in her study of the book of Revelation. If you enjoyed today's lesson, why not share her video? And be sure to click the like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and set your notifications by clicking the bell. Thanks again for watching. Have a blessed week, and we'll see you next time.